What's up guys? I'm Jake Thomas and today we've got a very special guest, also a very close near and dear friend, uh, Mr. Billy Davis. Billy is a, a triathlete, a real estate professional, uh, a lover of all humans, uh, an endorser of some intense, intense and amazingly beautiful uh, organizations. He'll tell you about that and some more. And a guy that's overcome a lot of things and somebody that I really tip my hat to as far as in the world of uh, health, wellness, spiritual and physical nutrition, and someone that I actually took a lot of notes from uh, in tutelage. So without further ado, Billy Davis. What's going on, man? Good to see you. Same. So, dude, I haven't seen you in a while. It's been a minute. Uh, it's been a minute. And um, we were talking a lot off camera, hearing a lot about your story, um, multiple stories. <laughs> so. so David was like, I will train you to do this Ironman. And David is brutal. He's Australian. He's a big dude. And he's just like... You're not training hard enough, Billy. Stop being a shit. Like, he would always say shit like that. So he was my swim buddy. So we're going out to swim in, in, in New York. They put us out there. I'm having a full-on panic attack. I peed in my wetsuit walking to the, pit, to the boards because I'm just like, this is not going to, I don't know what to do. I'm not ready. And they're like, just keep going. And they keep pushing me. I'm like, I don't, what? No one sees I'm panicking. And everybody saw it, but nobody wanted to acknowledge it because they wanted me to like, just, he'll be fine. Just get him in there. So I jumped in the water immediately it was hot that year and I remember I put my face in and it tasted like cat piss gasoline and uh, like salt <laughs> uh, and people and you know people can read more about you elsewhere but where do you where do you get the balls to think you can run triathlons <laughs> or, or or think or think I'm gonna be an Ironman you've never swam before you no. for, you were you you were 40 years old you had recently become an amputee you were a great college athlete now you're not or you weren't now <laughs> no, you're, <I'm> not. <laughs> now you've lost a leg yeah. and now and you still can't swim yet you think you're gonna be able to jump into some of the deepest water you can possibly get into yeah. physically mentally and other why too stupid to quit too dumb to die <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, there, you, you covered a lot of ground there. I mean, I, I was a Division One athlete. I was good. I wasn't great. I was, I was really, really good. But at, at D1, you have to, it helps to be great. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I think that a lot of things fell into place. One, I've had an amazing foundation of support. I couldn't have done any of this by myself. That's a big part of it. Um, I think that if you look at some of the great people in history, a lot of them have a backstory that kind of pushes them in that direction. Um, if you think of like your Kobe Bryant, his dad and his family were that way, you know, you know, you look at your Michael Jordans and he's got this great, like he was, there was a, there was a drive where he was trying to prove something. It wasn't even about being the best. It was, he just wanted to be better than his brother, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, my story starts with me being the child of two visually impaired parents. Um, my, both my parents met at a school for the blind. They could see, but it, they were legally blind, um, but they met in college. So I had these two really great examples of people who are disabled living in an able-bodied world that never quite acquiesced to them. And although I never thought I would be disabled, um, I did watch them navigate. And I learned like, sometimes you got to think outside of the box mm -hmm. and sometimes things will get done. It's just a little <laughs> bit slower. And, you know, and, and I walked a lot because we didn't have a car. Walking a lot led me to start on skateboards. And I got a little bit too big for skateboards. I started BMX. Then I started bending BMX bikes and BMX turned into mountain bikes, turned into road bikes. So there's the bike thing. Um, I did grow up in Kansas, which has no natural bodies of water. Uh, black in Kansas, insert stereotype, insert stereotype. Never learned to swim. Just never had it. I was always like, I can swim well enough to get out of water. And then I just tried to stay away from water. And when I did, most of the time, I was, it was a bad idea. So I just never did it. Um, when I lost my leg in 2012 in a motorcycle accident, um, which, you know, we can do that. I'll do that. You can DM me and I'll tell you that story. But uh, after losing that, I remember thinking in the hospital room, I'd, been on, I'd only been awake from my coma for a few days, and I remember thinking, I have to find something harder than this to focus on. I need a bigger thing. Otherwise, this, this can't be the most physically demanding thing I do all day. I'd spent my life to that point. I'd built it on my body. I'd moved to New York in 98, eventually became a personal trainer. You know, and then you know, this was only two and a half, maybe four years into me being a trainer. And I remember thinking, okay, well, I'm a trainer now. Let, actually, I take that back, probably closer to six. But either way, thinking, okay, like, I got to find a physical thing to focus on because to me that made sense. Be physical, find a win that you can focus on. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. 
So find, a, find something you can win at that gives you the confidence of winning. What can I do? And I was like, and I remember, the, you know, honestly, the first thing I thought of, Everest, no. People die. <laughs> don't want to lose a finger or nose. And I don't want to get all the way up there in two minutes and get pulled. So I was like, what can we do that's, that I will do? And I thought, Iron Man. And immediately I thought, shit, now I got to do an Iron Man. I don't know how to swim. I hate running distance, but I really like riding bikes. Mm -hmm. So between two things I don't like and can't do, there'll be this little bit of joy. <laughs> like I, gotta, I just got to look forward to the bike. Decent and then, odds. Decent odds. You know, two out of, you know, one out of three is not great, but it's there. <laughs> so, it gets you in the Hall of Fame in baseball. It would, yeah, if you're one for three. So I, I did that, and that was the declaration. And it took a while. I mean, I lost a leg in 12. Didn't do my first triathlon until 15. And... Um, when I did the first one, it was terrifying. It was awful. It was, it was brutal. I failed miserably. I had a panic attack. I was telling you that someone had to drag me a mile in the water with their foot under my arm, me getting waterboarded for 30 minutes. And I got out and thought I lost. And they were like, no, you're still in it. And my first thought was still like, damn it. I thought I'd lost this one. Like, I'm still got a race. Fine. <laughs> so I did it and I finished. And then when I was done, I was like, all right, let's do it again. You know, my... My natural thing, to, my natural reaction to things I'm scared of or don't like, and you'll appreciate this because I think I did this when you asked me about the swim, is no. And I think about it and I'm like, eh, maybe I should do that. And then I say yes, but it's always no. And then it's, okay, yes, always no. I never want to do anything like that. Even Iron Man. I don't, shit. Okay, I got to do an Iron Man. Navy SEAL swim. What we say? No. And yeah. you were like, I was like, ah, and you were like, dude. You'll never be safer than five in water with 500 fucking Navy SEALs and armed <laughs> swimmers. And I was like, he's making a lot of sense. <laughs> Shit. Okay. All right. Fine. And then I went through and failed. <laughs> yeah, but smiling. I smi failed with a smile on my face. So that's just the way I do things. And the Iron Man thing, it's, it, you know, I figured being a personal trainer at the time, if you do the research on something like that, swimming, cycling, and running are really great ways for people with limb loss to stay in shape if your body is at least at a particular baseline, which mine was. And again, I, I thought, there's no way that I will drown in the water after living through this accident. Mm -hmm. there's, there's just, there, the fates cannot be that cruel. And so that's kind of what started me on my journey. Um, by the time I got to my first triathlon, I'd, I'd already turned it, actually that year, I came up with the idea of Cheeseburger Day, which was, I'm going to ask people to don't, because when I, let me back up a little bit for people that weren't here before. I woke up and the first thing I asked for was a cheeseburger and a Coke. Every year on the anniversary that I wake up, I celebrate with a cheeseburger and a Coke, as do my circle of friends. So the first year I did a triathlon, I needed to raise money to help pay for some of my training and equipment. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I'll ask people to pay for, to donate the cost of a cheeseburger and a Coke to a foundation that I will donate and blah, blah, blah. And it worked. Everybody likes cheeseburger. And that just, well, most people. And that worked. My cheeseburger. favorite cheeseburger is not necessarily the most popular one because... My Which favorite is yours. Which it's, is mine yours? is probably something with like a turkey burger with avocado and bacon. Interesting. Okay. It's like a bear burger, specialty burger. Yeah, bear burger if they have it, but it's a specialty. Yeah, burger. it's a specialty it's burger. I'm I'm all about a te like a gua a spicy guacamole, a turkey burger with like bacon. No would be way. Ideal. No way. I would have guessed that. Where Where is the Californian that's that's in that? You know, saying this. That's, I have no idea. Okay. I'm, yeah, it's a very that's, California. I mean, the Kansas guy does. I mean, it's I beef. Would hit, yeah, I'm yeah. thinking like he's going classic American barbecue sauce. Yeah, cheddar, yeah, bacon. You yeah. Know? Okay. Bacon, yes, because that's God's gift to me. Okay. I think uh, bacon is God's gift. <laughs> Every year around May, in May, I have a big fundraiser. Okay. We do it at some place. Usually they curate a burger or a few, and yeah, then we, we have everybody come and eat cheeseburgers, and we have donations, and then I donate that to an organization that helps with limb loss. I've worked with uh, Limb Kind most recently, which has been beautiful. I love those guys. It's been all over the world with them. Achilles, who helps me with a lot of my races. Mm -hmm. Aspire, who gives uh, prosthetics to children. Um, Dim Cell, which helps with children in Sierra Leone. I've worked with them. Wiggle Your Toes out of Minnesota. I've worked with them. They were the first organization I worked with. And I just, I do that. And it became a thing that's bigger than me now. Mm -hmm. So now I'm kind of, I feel like it's almost a legacy game. You know, at some point I won't be able to do this or won't be here. And people hopefully will still have a cheeseburger in my honor once a year and hopefully donate some money and help somebody else out. And it's all about using your superpower to help other people. So that's, I'm really big on that. It's another yeah, superhero that's... in two weeks. We were talking uh, with a guy you'd know really well the other day, uh, Steve Lewis, I okay. mentioned to you. Yep, yep, yep. Um, you know, calls himself the, your neighborhood friendly Olympian. It's like Billy's another, another one of these superheroes. And like to hear someone 
talking about superheroism. Super heroism. It's a pretty good company. Not a big salt guy. Oh. I mean, on the fries, maybe a little bit. <laughs> but, you know, everything's got sodium in it. I don't need any more salt. I'm salty enough. <laughs> so, man, like, Iron Man's a beast. Yes. You know, and what, um, what, what, you know, you talked about growing up, how you grew up. I mean, parent, son of two visually impaired parents. Yes. That's got to be a trip. First off, like, because you said that very casually, but like I locked on to that. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, it's awesome. You're D1 athlete at University of Kansas. Mad respect to that. Go Jayhawks. Rock out, rock out. Yeah. Um, everything else you've done, you, you know, when I met you, you were already 25 years seasoned as a trainer. Um, and for anybody that doesn't know, Billy's gone through thousands of clients, has helped and influenced thousands, if not tens of thousands of people physically, for sure. Taught me my personal trainer certification. That's how we actually met. So like literally this was my Yoda to learn the ways of the force. And um, continues to do so to this day, has been countless and still otherwise streaming content services and a lot mm -hmm. of videos you would know that he's gonna be very modest about not talking about. But to be the son of two visually impaired parents, that's a really small group of people, mm -hmm. meaning you. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, you know, you asked like, how was that? It because I didn't have anything else, it was just, that's what it was. Yeah. It, it was, the, logis the logistically it looked like we didn't have a car, so our driveway never had a car in it. Our garage was more of a den. Um, so I walked a lot, I used public transportation a lot, rode a lot of dirt bikes and skateboards, and that was kind of the only other thing. We didn't, my parents weren't so visually impaired that they needed a seeing eye dog, so you just knew like, it was more like a game. Like, if anything, I probably learned really poor housekeeping habits because when they'd say clean the house, it'd be more like, well, just put this over here so mom can't see it. <laughs> you know, and then mom would be like, why did you put shit behind the... St clean the house. And I'd be like, okay, let's put it over here so she can't see it. Oh, God. So it was more like a game that way. But other than that, it wasn't really any, you know... I have a younger sister. We're about three years apart, okay. and we're probably on opposite sides Got of it. how that landed. She's adorable, and she's... She looks like me and could not be more different. So she's stunning and she looks just like me, which is freakish because you wouldn't think I'd make an attractive woman, but I have proof that I would. <laughs> and my sister is drop dead gorgeous and just as alpha, just as direct, like just gets shit done. I've met siblings that are closer than, our, than we are. Got it. But <laughs> I love her to death and would take a bullet for her. We just probably don't hang out as much as like, we, it's good that we're a half country away from each other, but you know, when, but I love her to death. She's awesome. She just, shout out to, you know, to M Melissa. She just had a, her first grandchild recently. Congratulations. And my nephew Elijah's beautiful daughter, Nomi. So good job on him and can't wait to meet the little baby. Um, but yeah, there, she, you know, she's awesome. She's just, she's just different. We're just, you know, sometimes you get a few kids that are not, we weren't like, we, there was a time when we were. And then as we grew up, I just took a different path. I was super extroverted and super social and let me try everything mm -hmm. and I want to do everything and Melissa is more like kind of let me do my own thing I'm good she's a lot more introverted than I am mm -hmm. so we just kind of are different in that way we went through the same family stuff that right. other people went through my it's I, I can't imagine how hard it was particularly for my father he was um he was a musician with perfect pitch and ex by every account a musical genius no one that ever met him did not think that. And he was raised by a pig farmer with not a lot of formal training around like a lot of life skills. So he knew saxophone and that's what he knew. So he was a super entrepreneurial, A-focused person with a bit of a temper and a really competitive, aggressive <laughs> streak of like getting shit done. But I also recognize that like when, when all you have is a hammer, everything is a nail. Ooh. So sometimes it helps to have more than just a hammer in your toolbox. And I'll be honest, my father, God rest his soul, Wild Bill, love you. I don't know that he had much more than a couple of hammers in his toolbox. He was excellent with them, but all he had was hammers. Not even a rubber one? It was hard rubber. It was more like, <laughs> <laughs> like a mallet <laughs> with metal inside. Like yeah. he's just, he was yeah. a hard guy, but he, he did the best he could with what he had. So, you know, I, 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 I think that part of coming into your own is recognizing your winning formula, as they mm -hmm. would call it in certain things, in right. certain, if you've ever done like Landmark. You know, these are things that, that produce success, but if gone unchecked, can also like sink you because you don't know how to turn them off. Yeah. And I think the biggest difference between my father and I is I have learned, okay, that works, and then I get to check in and go, okay, is it working for me now? Mm 
-hmm. because if it's not, maybe I want to try something else. A lot of people think like I'm doing it myself, but it's also if you're doing it yourself, you also don't have a third party to kind of to correct. Mm -hmm. And there, are, you talk about a small percentage of people that can do it themselves. Most people need a room or it takes a, set a village. It, it takes a village. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people think they're doing it themselves and realize it really, you can only do so much yourself. You know, the, the collective is stronger than the individual. You know, that's, that's, you know, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. But also, you want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, go together. Yep. That sort of thing. And when you have a collective that can say, hey, Jake, you're awesome. And have you ever looked at this place over here that you're maybe not shining as much light on? Because people typically do well what they do, what you, you do best, that's what you do at. most. So if you're doing something, you're like, dude, I'm great at this. Why would I change it? But you're not looking at like, maybe I could do this other thing mm -hmm. a little bit better. And maybe if I got better at that, this would be even better. And so that's, I think that I've, I've spent enough time doing personal development, taking seminars, reading books, and then always putting myself in situations where like, let's do coaching. I mean, I was in a coaching thing just last night for relationships and I'd been through it before, similar things, but still like, let's see if we can pick up another tool. And sure enough, Three hours later, that's awesome. I picked up another relationship style. Perfect. So, I am not Yoda, by the way. Um, I'm a Star Wars was, fan. Yoda is at, at, at that best well. Obi-Wan. <laughs> that I mean, was come a good on. analogy. I really do think that there's a, I don't even know if it's a trait so much as a wiring. When I joke and say I'm too dumb to quit, too st or too stupid to quit, too dumb to die, mm -hmm. I think that my overlying path in life has, always, has never been that I pick up things quickly. It's I'm not smart enough to know when not to stop or when to stop. I can think back to high school and, you know, I didn't, I didn't, the first time I put on a set of pads, I was 14 years old and, you know, in 1989 or something, most kids don't learn football as a freshman in high school. I was fit. I was huge. I had a 515 deadlift, but I'd never, I didn't know enough about football to know there were two different teams. So when the coaches, they saw me, they were like, oh my God, play football. Do you know how to play? No because we didn't have a car, so I couldn't go to practice. So I never learned any organized sports. Went, never played baseball. I played one season of baseball, couldn't throw the ball, they put me in the outfield. You don't learn anything just standing out in right field, because that's where they put the worst player on the team with the strongest <laughs> arm, which is where I did. I just sat out there all night bored in the heat, like, and every, like once a game I hear, Davis, and I'd look up and there'd be a ball flying at me. So baseball sucked, it was hot, and we never won. So I didn't want to play baseball. Football sounded like fun, because I could lift weights and I could at least hit people. But I didn't understand that there were plays. I didn't understand that there were special teams. So when they gave me the ball and told me to run, I could run over you. Mm -hmm. But if you showed me a play, I was like, ooh, not quite sure. So we had to, they, luckily it was freshmen. So they figured out a way that I could do it. And by, I remember my first year of freshman ball, I was so bad that they would put me as a, I was a defense, I was a, I was a tight end. And they couldn't figure out what to do with me. So they would just say, okay, they'd say the play. And then someone would go, Billy go to the left and block. And I would do that. And it, every single game my freshman year, it would only be a matter of time before someone would go, number nine's on the left. They're going to the right. <laughs> like they would just, that's just what they would do because they knew I didn't know what to do and they would never throw the ball to me because I couldn't catch it, which we didn't figure out until actually a few years ago why I never caught a football. When your father is blind, guess what you never do? Play, Play catch. catch. You don't throw stuff at blind people. So I never played catch as a kid. So anything involving a ball, football, basketball, baseball, never played. Because we didn't have any balls in the house. So I could wrestle, but that's hands-on. Wrestled with dad all the time. He loved to wrestle, but I never played ball. Could play for, and then it, eventually I became a decent football player. But my flaw was, and I think this was on my scouting report my senior year, I was, they had blue chips, red chips, white chips. I was a blue chip overshadowed by hero in the past and they knew Davis can't catch a football to save his life. I could run with it, but I couldn't catch. And that was just, but what hit him easy? Track and field. And that's where I excelled because <laughs> all you got to do is run. Just get there before that guy. And I could always do that. So I was always the strongest and the fastest, but not necessarily the thing, the best in anything. So again, my, my, to answer your question, my thing was tenacity. I just, never knew when to stop. I was always like, well, I am tired, but I could do one more. Kind of like Forrest Gump, you know, just like you said, run faster. So I just ran faster and I just kept running faster until I ran out of people to run faster than. And then eventually you're just standing there like, 
Nobody left? Okay, like, is there no one else? And then you're done. And I just kept doing that until I ran out of races. I, you know, I just, I just had a feeling. I, w I knew there was somebody sitting right there, so if I went down, they were going to reach out and grab me. I was like, I'm okay with coming back from being revived. I've died once, you know, the accident, you know, I flatlined twice. So I figured if I started to drown, somebody would see it and pull me out. <laughs> if you're a guy of a certain age in America, you grew up watching the montages, and, you know, Rocky 1 was amazing. He didn't win. Rocky 2 is a battle of Apollo Creed because Apollo was struggling with, like, how do I beat this guy that, that eats pain for breakfast? You know, Rocky or that was Rocky 2. Rocky 4, you've got that amazing training montage in the mountains. Yeah. I, my my 515-pound deadlift was to the soundtrack of Conan the Barbarian. Ooh. I grew up, <laughs> like, watching those movies and wanting to be in those montages. You know, I would ride bicycles in high school to the soundtrack of Top Gun because mm. I'm driven by, like, power music and the 80s like yep, yep. so I love to be part of my own training montage yep. and I don't mind pain I don't mind being uncomfortable um, when I was a kid I would ride bicycles all day I would dirt bike all day from one side of town to the other go to sleep and wake up in the middle of the night with leg cramps and that's how you know you had a good day you woke up like, but I just I've just always kind of been that way and I I think that in in growing up, the way that my par my parents just always there was never a hard there was never an issue with hard work. You just worked hard. Mm -hmm. I think if anything, again to a fault, I probably got more invested in the hard work maybe sometimes than the results. And I've seen that come up in places where the gr you get so invested in being part of the grind. Case in point. So my buddy David Knight, who trained me for Iron, who trained me for my first try, the very first triathlon we did was Chelsea Piers as an indoor kind of a test run to see, nice. kind of make sure everything works. And I remember we had done like the snake swim and I sucked every time I got to the water. It was just a snake swim in a 20 meter pool and yeah. I'm having panic attacks. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, Billy, put your feet down, you're fine. Okay, okay. And I swim out and then we get on the bike and I was fine and then we get on the, we get on the, on the uh, course and it's like a, I don't know, a mile loop, it's something crazy. Oh, it's so, a track there? It's an yeah, indoor yeah, track, yeah, it's yeah. really easy and it's a three mile run. Right, right. And it's I'm a beautiful like, facility. Beautiful. Yeah. And I'm running and I'm just going, God, this sucks. Fucking A, man. And in my head, I'm in a training montage. Yep. I'm Rocky. <laughs> fucking A, <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, <gasps> and David looks at me and he goes, Billy, are you having fun? And I was like, yeah. He goes, well, then tell your face because it's not fun to run next to you when you're cursing yourself out. And it was the first time I was like, oh, yeah. Like, I don't, it doesn't have to be this brutal, painful, awful thing. But I was in love with being in the montage. I did do the Empire State 86 floor climb last year. Wow. Not last year, but the year before, which is, I'm, I'm assuming more. <laughs> yeah. What do you see as like, is it physical endurance or slash mental toughness that attributes to ability in sport? Or is it life experience, resilience that attributes to ability to the form, to the other, you know, like, are you getting more out of your physical abilities? And mm -hmm. I say abilities, not disabilities. Mm -hmm. Are you getting more out of what you do physically because you draw on that power from life? Or do you get more from life because of what you're able to leverage from physicality? I think it's synchronous. I think they all kind of leverage each other. I mean, you know, thank God I wasn't born with spina bifida or, you know, or CP or, you know, something like that. That would be a different challenge. Yeah. Um, I do believe that the universe, God, Whatever you believe in never gives you more than you can handle. So if that's the case, then I got... Because I see other athletes that are blind, and I'm like, I'm doing this one. Like, you can't see. I can't imagine, like, jump in the water and swim until we tell you you're done. Mm. Like, I can't see anything. Like, how do blind athletes do that? Yeah. I can't imagine running blind, like, with someone tethered to me. That makes no sense. Mm. But they're like, how do you do that with one leg? I don't know how not to do it. Like, people always ask, how do you swim? I don't know how to swim with two, so swimming with one just kind of happened. You know, in terms of, you know, if it's physical ability, granted, I come from a, let's just say, at least above average genetic pack. You know, both my grandfathers were pretty good sized guys. My, gr my grandfather, especially on my dad's side, was a giant man and he was a pig farmer. So if that gives you like, was he a pig farmer because he was tough or because he was big? Who knows? But it took both. Mm -hmm. So I've got that going through me. I've got my dad's tenacity, who wasn't necessarily a a physical guy, but he was intense. So I learned that and I got that. And if you take those things and then, you know, I told you the story about when I was a kid and I got teased about being, having holes in my right. shoes and something about that just pissed me off. Mm -hmm. And so I'm okay running on anger. I am, 
And I don't, I'm not saying, I'm not saying you should be angry when you compete, mm -hmm. but the way I got through a lot of fitness, I worked out a lot of stuff. I got teased a lot as a kid, being a black kid for, with disabled parents. You know, my hands are burnt from an accident when I was 13 months old. So in school, I was, you know, Billy Davis, you know, kids would drive by me in the snow in their cars and, and honk while I'm walking in the snow, dragging a 20 pound saxophone because my dad wouldn't let me leave it at school because it was his. And I'm like, it's cold. I don't have mittens. I've got socks on my hands and I'm dragging a saxophone. And my friend just rode by in a car. And then I get to school and they're making fun of me because my hands are burnt and my parents are blind and we don't have a car. And then you go on a field trip. You're, you remember when you go on field trips and your, friend, your parents would drive? Mm -hmm. And it was the coolest thing because you got to ride in the front right. and you got to put your friends in the car. Right. That's all I ever wanted in the fifth grade. I just want my parents to drive on a field trip. Mm -hmm. But we couldn't do that. So I ne I'd, I'd ride with the teacher or I'd ride with a friend. But all I really wanted was for my parents to drive. And you can't do anything about that. But I don't understand that. So when I figured out that I could even the playing field by just winning a little bit. And if winning meant, you know, a lot of it is just effort. You know, yeah, you, you, genetics aside, we all know that a lot of champions, it comes down to mentality. Period. All th once you get to a certain level of athletics, once you get to college, everybody's a state champion. Yep. Everybody's got records. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Yep. Like, I had a state championship. This guy's got three. You know, yep. I was ranked nationally. This guy was done four times. Are we stopping? Or? No, no, you're good. So, you know, that doesn't really matter. And then, yep. you, it's like, we're all fast. Then it comes down to technique. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we, I remember the first time I learned plyometrics. So now everybody's got techniques, but I'm in the Big 12. So it's Texas, Texas Tech, Texas A&M, Oklahoma, Nebraska, K-State. They've all got technique. They've all got coaches. So now it comes down to like, okay, now it's a gut check. Who wants it? Right. Yeah. Who's willing to be an uncomfortable more? Who's willing to suck it up when it hurts? And... I know I can think of two examples in college. One was Nebraska had recruited an Olympian from Canada to run against them, to run with them. And this guy was beautiful. His name was Mark Lawrence. He's passed away. He was, he was killed in, in, a, in war, uh, rest in peace. But he was this beautiful six foot three quarter miler with this. He looked like he walked out of a Janet Jackson video. I mean, he was stunning. And he, he ran like a giant gazelle. And I remember we were indoors one year. I think it was Oklahoma at the Big 12s. And they were like, Billy, we're going to put you against Mark. And I was like, I can't beat that guy. Look at him. And my coach was like, you got to take his heart. He goes, yeah, just, he goes, rush him on the corners and take his heart. You'll beat him. And I was like, okay. And I did it. And he folded. And I beat him. And I was just like, oh, my God. Like, that worked. Same season. Another example. I'd run all my races. And they needed someone to run one more quarter for a relay. And I was like, coach, I don't have it. He's like, you don't even have to run fast. If you run your slowest time of the season, we still win. You will win a Big 12 title. And that day, mentally, I was like, I don't, I can't. And I, and I, I thought about it, and I, I said no. And the coach didn't prod me. He's like, all right. And he walked away. And they ran it with somebody else who was not nearly as good. And they lost by about three seconds. Or less, whatever time it was, I would have done it. And I watched it, and as I'm watching, I'm like. I could have fucking done that. What is he doing? I could have done that. And I remember thinking, I'm never letting that happen again. And that was kind of a thing. You know, um, in high school, I just, I, I always like, I, my mentality when I compete is, if you're not wearing my car, my colors, F you. Like, that's just the way I, I I'm like, we can be friends before, yeah. we can be friends after. Yeah. But between go and stop, if you're, if I don't, we don't have like, like screw that guy and that guy because yeah. he's not wearing our colors. Yeah. <clears throat> I will eat your lunch and spit on your children yeah. until it's over. And then when it's over, we can shake hands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in high school, for, I, the way I won my title, my quarter mile title is actually a cool story because I'd been going back and forth with this other guy who's, uh, if he's watching, Adam Bowers, I love you. Adam was this beautiful biracial guy with, with light skin and blue eyes. And if you're a black guy, you hate black guys with blue eyes because they get all the <laughs> chicks. It's just, okay. it's not, they're just too fucking pretty. <laughs> And I remember I hated Adam because he was beautiful. And he was very, very talented. And all, and all season, we're one and two from different schools in different cities. But we were always like one and two. And I would finish races and they'd be, I'd be like, fuck Adam Bowers at the end of races. And the coach was like, dude. And I'm like, screw that guy. And, and other coaches, other students or their parents would be like, you know, Adam Bowers ran a 49.8. And I'd be like, fuck Adam Bowers. And I'd go out and run a 49.3. Mm. And we would just go back and forth. 
So the pre, at the prelims to the state finals that year, we were in different prelims and we both ran really well. We were going to be kind of, we were going to be in the finals. It was going to be Adam versus myself. And a coach walks up to me or a reporter walks up and he goes, can I interview you? Of course. How are you feeling this season? I'm killing it. I'm undefeated, you know, in my thing. And Adam's undefeated in his and we're one and two. And, and the last thing the reporter says, he goes, so do you have any final words for Adam Bowers? And I was like, you tell Adam Bowers to eat his Wheaties because I'm coming for him tomorrow. And the, guy, and the guy goes, can I quote you on that? I was like, absolutely. <laughs> it's freaking Bart Scott here. Just, 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 I was, I was mad. Wait. <laughs> yeah, just, I'm going to kill that guy. And the reporter walks off and the coach goes, pretty big words, Davis. I'm like, you got it, coach. He goes, hope you don't choke. And I was like, what? I was like, do you know something I don't know? This is the same guy. He was, hope you don't choke. And I was like, why would you say that? Why? And all of a sudden I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I was, he completely broke. Like, I was like, oh shit, I'm in trouble. Was he? I, I don't, I, yeah, I think he was just, I think our coaches were always like, you don't brag until you win. Mm. Like, you don't get to put up number one until you've got the title, you got the chip. Mm. And I think it was kind of more along those lines, like, humble yourself and keep calm. Like, just take it easy. But I heard, hope you don't choke. And I was just like, eh! couldn't sleep that night. I got so in my head, I devised a way to lose the race. I came up with a plan. Oh. I said, I'm going to false start. I will get disqualified. Adam will win, and he will have never beat me. And I can always be like, you didn't beat me. Wow. And I was okay with that. That's amazing. And I went into a final with that. I also want to be responsible. That was arguably 30 years ago. And I've remembered it a particular way. So I reserve the right to be absolutely wrong. Mm. But I know whatever he said, that's what I heard. Right. So he might have said something a little different. We all know that if you go back, right, right, right. but that's but exactly nonetheless, what I said. you internalized. That I internalized it. Exactly. Smoldered on it. So when the race actually happened, I was in my head going, I'm going to, I'm trying to false start. And whether I did or wow. didn't, I had the best start of my race. I go around the curve and people that saw this race, I've got fit pictures of it. We go around and Adam's on the outside. And I remember we, he started his kick early and this is a 400, I was a 400 meter runner, mm, which is just deep. a brutal race. That's we come around the back stretch and it's, I remember them going, and it's Adam Bowers, Billy Davis and Kerry Bowlesley in that order. And I was like, shit, I'm losing. Adam was on my right. And I remember running out, I ran wide on my lane and started doing this because I was just panicking. If it was a fist fight, I'd have bit him because I was just freaking out. And Adam was like, stop it, Billy. And I'm just like, <laughs> like, I couldn't figure out how to run any faster. And as we got to the last 15 meters, if you run a 400, your knees stop coming up and it's just piss arms, and vinegar, arms, arms, arms and arms, you're arms. just like, whatever it takes. And in that moment, I had a moment and I remember thinking, I got to dive. And so I dove for the finish line at a quarter mile. And so the picture, which is in a yearbook somewhere, is me flying over the finish line, shoulder first, and Adam leaning. And I beat him by three one-hundredths of a second. I probably would have been faster if I'd have stayed on my feet because I dove a little early. But the finish was so epic that everybody was just like, oh! like everybody comes out of the stands and like they had to stop the race and we got to look at the tape and like look at the pictures and my shoulders bleeding and this coaches are like disqualify him he's a like he hit my kid and like he was elbowing him. didn't just he's a dirty racer and I'm like ah. but you know that's just how badly I that that's a perfect way that I just do, that's how I do things I freak out I panic just like everybody else mm -hmm. and then I figure out a way like okay let me find a way to do something and that's kind of been my, my process through a lot of these events. It's not that I'm this amazing athlete. I just don't know when to stay down. I just keep figuring out a way to like, okay, we just got to get up one more time. Just get up one more time. Just get up. And somehow I do. You're talking about, um, you know, as you got higher up the mountain in competition, levels of competition, like D1, right? Yeah. Meaning like, yeah, you were able to get by on genetics and god-given ability for a while and gr and of course like you know yeah, just grit, grit yeah, right yeah, yeah. like you can just figure it out but once you got to the big 10 big 12 sorry at the time the big 12 it was uh yeah everybody's fast everybody's big everybody has the x amount of years, probably more years of yeah yeah, right? yeah, Every, yeah. Da, 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 da. so in life and we talk about this with with people all the time like i say hey man you're applying to that job or, hey, you're trying to get into this career path, everybody else went to Harvard too. Oh, cool, you want to go to law school? Well, everybody else has a perfect LSAT. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool, you want to go do this? Well, everybody else has that resume. Mm -hmm. You all have got the same pedigree. What makes you any different from the other dozen people's CVs that I'm going to look at? 
Meaning to like, if you act like no one cares or you're not special, even though you are, we all are unique and, and gifted, but if you act like you're not special and that it's just about you showing up and deciding within your mind that I'm just gonna do this and outdo everybody, I'm gonna compete with myself and I'm gonna win, I'm not gonna worry about what the field says. That to me is the level, a level up tool in life, right? So taking it literally from what you just said, like everybody else was fast, everybody else did this, it just came down to who wanted it more. Who was willing to suffer more for it? Who was willing to work harder for it? Who was willing to endure more with it? You know this now from running triathlons too. 99% of it is in your mind. Mm -hmm. It does take physical ability to do these things, it does. obviously, yeah. right? But when I first started doing this, um, I had to train for a week without headphones in my ears just to get used to that because I'd never done that for that period of time, mm -hmm. ever. I'd always train with music, I mean, before with mm -hmm. Walkmans and stuff, no, but in the iPod era. And I was like, I'm not just gonna show up on race day and not have music and get like uh, crippled or awkwardly, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. deal with that. I think a big reason a lot of people don't run those races, number one is the swimming, for sure. Mm -hmm. That thins the herd mass. And number two is not being able to have to be alone with your thoughts. Oh, for sure. Because of the lack of music. Oh, yeah. Oh, you yeah. know, and like when you ran your first one, you, you come out of that and you're like, damn, I, I was in the cave, man. You go into a mental abyss in the yeah. best way. Like you mm -hmm. explore caverns in your mind that you maybe only knew when you were asleep yep. or in a freaking coma, yep. for mm -hmm. example. And then you come out of that and you're like, I just had six hours to myself alone, of which the entire time you're battling this thing on your shoulder that's just saying, just quit. Oh yeah. Just stop. 100%. Over and over. It's, it's okay, you don't have to go. Just look, you can fake an injury. Yeah, yeah. You've got, you've got plenty of reasons why you're not Yeah, yeah. You fall start, start, start you, know, like, you just cheat. Plenty, of, plenty of reasons. But like, is that not life too? Though? It is. It right? is. Like, and it's the, always a choice. Is that not life in the sense that, like, if you show up and think, like, well, I'm entitled because I'm first generation American and my parents are immigrants and I grew up in this type of socioeconomic class and I came from what I think to be lesser than other people and my LSAT score wasn't the best and what does it matter? I mean, I think that there's a, I mean, I know for myself, there's always been a dual headed conversation. I, I, I remember watching an interview with Michael Jordan early in his career. Someone was sitting down, they said, you know, do you, do you ever look in the mirror and, and think like, I'm, as, like, I'm that good. And I remember Michael, he had the best answer. He goes, if I did, I would never tell you. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, so you can, you can think it, you just can't say it. And then on the other side of that, um, you may, you reminded me on, on my, on my way to my very first triathlon, I was just, it was a relay. There was a gentleman in the back seat who was a military gentleman, uh, vet, and he had learned how to sign into a woman's hands who was deaf and blind. And he would lead, he would guide her on Ironmans and they would sign the stuff and then he would just go. <laughs> and I remember at the time I was just fixated with like, you do Ironmans with a person who can't see or hear. How do you do like an Ironman? Like I want to do one and I don't know how. And he gave me the best advice I ever got for triathlons. He goes, anybody can do an Ironman. He goes, you give enough people time, they'll walk 26 miles. They'll swim a mile, you know, whatever. He goes, you just got to remember a few things. It's going to suck. It's going to be a long day and you're going to want to quit. And as long as you're okay with having that thought and every time you hear it or feel it, you take another stroke, you take another pump, you take another step. You just, okay, that's fine. It's gonna, it is a long day. It does suck. I do want to quit but I'm just not gonna today. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I reference that a lot because in every single one of these races, from the shortest sprint to the half Ironman I did in, in Jones Beach, you're always at some point like, why the fuck am I out here? Yeah. <laughs> it's five o'clock in the morning. Like I didn't get good sleep. I, don't have, I, can't be good. I can't do protein shakes on race day because I get race gut. I love a protein shake. It's, I can't sleep the night before because I'm trying to go over my stuff. As an amputee, with my situation, I have to bring like two legs and the bike plus the tri bag. It's so much gear. It's just, it's so, it's long. Everybody's doing like 40 mile rides. Most people, you do a 40 mile ride, it's taking three and a half, four hours tops, three and a half less. Yeah, because you're doing 20 miles an hour, right? Oh, Which yeah. I'm used to, like I could do prior to my accident. 20 miles an hour, 25 right. miles an hour, easy. Now I'm like 12 miles an hour. So for me to do a 45 mile bike ride, that's a five and a half hour commitment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a long time on a bike for anybody. So I have to modify all of my stuff for that. I told you my runs, yeah. you know, most people are running, you know, on an iron, you know, six, seven, I'm sorry, you know, 
10 mile an hour, 10 miles an hour ish. I mean, I'm sorry, that's not right. I'm doing my math. Whatever the math is, pretty short miles per hour running. My, or 20 minute miles. Uh, like, uh, 20 minute miles. Yeah, I'm doing like 20 minute miles. Most people are doing like 12, 10, mi 10 minute miles. I'm doing 20, which means for me to do a full marathon, that's a seven and a half, eight hour event. You, nobody wants to be in a prosthetic that long. Even if you could, why would you? So you do have to learn to fall in love with, like to endure, endure the pain, to eat hills, to like be okay with like this hurts and I'm going to do that. And then you have to deal with, okay, am I hurt or am I in pain? You know, so I have to deal with like, okay, I'm in pain, but am I hurt? And because of my situation, I'm taking more time to check the limb, make sure my stuff is okay. Mm -hmm. You know, making sure I have shoes that work with it. It's just, it's a lot. But you were a personal trainer in the New York area between 2000 and 2020. There's probably a 90% chance that our paths crossed. And if you got certified in that time, mm -hmm. there's a really good chance you, you, ran, you came in one of my classrooms. I mean, I, I certified a lot of people through a lot of different organizations at two different universities. So there's a pretty good chance we, we spoke. There's a lot of, lot of logistics and finances and, you know, it's not just like you're going to put this on the thing and start getting the emails and save the date. You know, you know from that, that takes time. It's study. It took everything to train for the half Ironman. A full Ironman is a part time job. Yeah. You know, you don't earn the Ironman chip at the race. You earn it in the year leading up to, yeah. you know, it's you got to have a bike that works for you. You got to have shoes. You have to have time. You have to be OK with like I'm getting up at four o'clock in the morning to be on the road by five so I can run until nine. And, you know, I still get, what I found is especially this time of year between training for triathlons, working and fundraising for my organization, I can only, I can do all three and one will always suffer. So I have to find a way, you know, to do all three. And that's always the challenge for me this time of year. Like, you know, it's because I can train for the race, but I also got to work. I got to earn a living. I'm not 20 years old and sponsored. You know, people all say, oh my God, you, you should be an Olympian. I'm 49 years old. Like there, it would be a Disney movie if I made it to the Olympics at this point. And, you know, and I'm, I, that's just not gonna happen. So I have to be realistic with, not that there are things I can't do, but I have to prioritize what I can do, given there's only so much I can make up a cur learning curve in a certain amount of time. Again, didn't grow up swimming. So swimming took a lot of time and now I'm comfortable with it. And yeah, Jones Beach was by far my greatest accomplishment, but it was because it, there was a hurricane. Mm -hmm. It was because of the distance, mm -hmm. you know, that's what made it a big win for me. So, so yeah. Like now, to bring it full circle, mm -hmm. you were mid-40s a few years ago. Mm -hmm. You're thinking, all right, let me take a crack at this New York City real estate animal yeah. that is so easy to wrangle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is not an oversaturated market by any no, means. No, not at all. And uh, is uh, surrounded by very friendly and yeah. loving to work. And, and don't forget people. how fun the market is. It's an easy market. Of which you have no control over. Conditions no, and, no. and things that change and whatnot. How much of what you've learned, you know, outside of that, were you able to find correlation to once you got in there? Like, how much of that did you leverage to get you through, like, continue to get you through? Like, we talked about it before um, when you were first starting. And I remember saying, like, like dude, it's, it's ups and downs. You know, it, it comes and goes. But leveraging the stuff that we know yeah. to be a competitive and comparative advantage. Yeah. Like, I talked about, I've talked about it a lot, but, like, to hear from somebody else, I want, I want to hear it anyway because I know... It's brought you success, but many people can't relate to that. Or it's very easy to want to dismiss, like, oh, all these people talk about it's sports and its relationship to life and its correlations to, like, like why, 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 why? And it's like, it doesn't have to be sport. No. Whatever something that you love, whatever something you've had to figure out or endure, anything that you can find as a parallel to make your understanding of whatever the feat might be easier. I, it's like a metaphor, mm -hmm. right? Like you talked about the characters earlier and, and people that you would see and dragging things through the snow. It's like you're very visual in what you're, how you're describing things. So for somebody that's like, I don't get it. Like, what am I good at? It's like, oh, you're a chef. Like, you want to talk about this? Like, put the chef hat back on. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you're a, a corporate exec C-suite person? Like, put that back on. Oh, you're a corporate exec C-suite C -suite, C -suite person that's having trouble, but you're also a mother and a marathoner outside of the office. Okay, put the marathoner and mother mind on in the corporate C-suite exec world, mm -hmm. and you're not going to feel as mm, down and out. But we've talked with people that have these assets that don't see that, that, that are mothers, that are parents, that are people that have all these accolades 
for a four or that precede mm -hmm. their careers, their professional careers. But you're, you were on the brink of 50 and said, hell, why not? <laughs> you know, like, how? How do too you dumb do to that? quit, too stupid to, or too stupid to quit, too dumb to die. No, I, I, think, I think one, I really do believe that the way you do anything is the way you do everything. I learned that a long time ago. So I, you know, I, I told you, I, one of the reasons I like triathlon is I knew if I can just learn to swim and see myself getting better swimming, that's got to translate somewhere. Yes. I also, with regard to real estate, I feel like real estate and personal training had very, very similar skill sets. You know, the, the, the program design is about 12 weeks. Um, yeah. Open to close on a transaction for real estate is about three months, 90 days. Um, I feel like there were, you know, in kind of the market, for example, I, I equate a lot to swimming. You know, if you can only swim in a pool, that's great, but that's like only being able to sell in a, in a good market. You really need to learn how to swim against riptides and hurricanes. Right, and, and in the worst times, what do exactly. you do? Calm down, mm -hmm. put your face in the water, and breathe. and breathe. And that's real estate's the same way. If you listen to any real estate coach, they'll tell you like, when the market's bad, the, the instinct is, I'm just gonna stay home because there's nothing to do. Mm -hmm. When the reality is, go out and meet some people, talk to some folks. Double down, shake Double hands. Double down, shake hands. Now, the way, the way that I've, dis the way I've decided, or the way I've It's not a great uh, commission, but I'm working because that's what we do. And it's a fifth floor walk up. All right, let's do it. And I go there and then I, uh, there's the client, there's the other agent, and I'm wearing long pants and I don't say anything, mm -hmm. you know, but here we go. I'm like, go ahead, I'll get there. And you see me walk upstairs one at a time, very slow. I can either go two arms, two steps and blow out my bicep or one step and I'm super, super slow. I almost in Jones Beach during a hurricane, mm -hmm. a month after traveling to Sri Lanka to make prosthetics for kids, if he cares that much about people and will work that hard, imagine what he's gonna do to make sure that my listing gets exactly. sold. Even if I'm not the million dollar listing guy, you know, I don't have a $20 million book, I haven't been doing this for a million years, I don't have a team, you know, I don't, come, I don't have anybody to call, be like, hey mom, this is a rough month, can you send me something? I don't have that, so I have to find ways to make stuff happen. You know, and I have to hustle and I have to bite down and I have to be creative. And, and then sometimes you just got to be tougher than the next guy. And so I came into this thinking, I'm, I'm just going to try to outwork people exactly. as best I can. And if that means I don't get to wear as nice a suit because I show up a little bit sweatier, well, you know what? It's, you know, you mentioned when you get, man, you're kind of hot. I run hot because I've got a circulatory issue because I lost a leg and they had to reroute some, some of the veins. So I'm, I'm always sweaty. It's good. Not good good always, hug. Good yeah, hug. But really. I'm just saying, like, I'm, I'm too... I'm too mechanical to be suave. I walk too awkward, like <laughs> oh, yeah. I couldn't get into luxury real estate because I can't wear luxury shoes because I need shit that's fine. advantage sometimes oh no it's good well no, no it <laughs> is good but when everybody's like hey we're going out to drinks i'm i'm not the one that's like hey let's okay give me a ginger beer and then after three ginger ales or ginger beers i'm like i want to go home because these benches are too high it's loud floor right. getting wet it's right. getting dark i'm getting knocked over but your top real estate agents are still there telling stories oh. yeah. so i gotta learn to like okay well let me just be a little bit more not so like oh people are bumping into me but more like okay let's let's tell a fun story <laughs> you know, and, but I feel like that you'll remember, everybody remembers the one legged guy that was at the, at the party that yeah. told a really cool story about cheeseburgers yeah. that did the Iron Man. Yeah. They may or may not remember the really attractive blonde of which there were six that also sell real estate 
Does this not sound? <laughs> does this not sound like yesterday? It, yesterday we were talking with someone else, and I was mentioning, you know, like people asking how to deal with societal, peer, professional, or otherwise pressure, social pressure, to drink particularly. Mm -hmm. If I'm trying to get your business, or if I'm trying to recruit you to, for my business, and we're all sitting at a table, everybody's drinking, we're all getting sloshed, it's awesome, blah, 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 leg or otherwise, be damned. I'm going to remember the person that's locked on, squared away, for that reason alone. More than I am going to remember the ones that are like, yeah, let's do it, da, 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 like whether it's the six blondes or the rest of us that right, are right. doing the same thing. Because again, if I'm about to entrust you with the keys to my kingdom, or if I'm trying to get yours out of you, I don't want to be just like the rest. Mm -hmm. I want to show up and be like, man, I'm, I'm the Marine that showed up to that guy. That way he sees that in me through and through, knows that we're athletes, knows our resumes speak for us because of how we exude ourselves. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, yeah, you got lost in translation with the rest of the people from right, XYZ right. schools totally. and stuff like that. But it's like, I would always remember the individual like that. It's like, do you want to be remembered as one of them or do you want to be remembered for who you are? You've seen somebody with a disability out there with a blade or a prosthesis. Yep. And what do you do when you ride by him? You got this. Good job, man. So I get that all the time. I, you know, you got this, yeah. and, and here's what we do, what, what I do and I think a lot of athletes do. You take it, thank you. Don't, I don't need you to come over and have a conversation because right. I'm on a treadmill or I'm on a bike. But you want to say great, appreciate it. But here's what I do. I internalize it, I take it. Then you do that 45 mile ride or half Ironman, let's say Jones Beach, 56 miles. It took me twice as long to get out of the water as everybody else. So now we're on the bike and everybody else is doing 25 miles an hour with a headwind and a tailwind, I'm doing 12. So by the time I get on the bike, I'm way in the back. I'm, I'm, so the longer I'm on the bike, the fewer people I'm seeing. But that's when I start to remember, that guy said you're a badass. Mm -hmm. You're Billy motherfucking Davis. I'm okay, I'm a, you're, I'm a fucking inspiration. This is why I'm Billy motherfucking Davis and they're not. That's right. And that's when I start pulling out all of those Central Park accolades and all those training things when people are like, you got this, I'm like, I got this. I'm okay. That's all those people said. This is why. This is why people bo donate cheeseburgers. We're good. We're good. We're fine. We're not dead. We're not dead. We're good. You know, and that's when it, that's what I do with it. And I think a lot of athletes in my position do the same thing. You know, and, and again, it's, you, you just, you kind of get used to like kind of in fall, falling in love with the grind. You endorse the pain and, and the, and the, and the whole, th the whole bit of it. And the way you do anything is the way you do everything. So if you can figure out a way, oh, oh there's one more thing you, you, I, I thought of. I also feel like, especially in, in, in real estate, I feel like if there's a mistake to be, if I make a mistake, I also feel like I'm really quick to like, look, this is what I didn't do or where I dropped the ball. Let me take responsibility for this and I'm correct. You know, rather than some people who would, you know, and I, and I, I, don't, I don't mean to thread a needle where I'm like, because everybody says they do this, but I, I know there are people when you do some shit, you're like, ooh kind of drop the ball there. If I don't have to clean that up, maybe I just won't say anything. Yep. You know, because you don't want to look bad. Yep. And I think that I'm really big on like, you know what, I missed the ball on something. Let me show you where I didn't do this right. And I can, I can correct it because I'm coming with a solution as well. But I may not have, like this guy may have done this, you know. I'll be the first one. I've only got 3,500 followers. So if I throw something on social media, it's not going to land like a, somebody that's got tens of thousands. Now, could I, could I buy 10,000 followers on IG? I could, but we all know that's BS, so I don't. I'm all about let's just do stuff organically. So I'll tell people, yeah, I'm going to throw stuff on IG, just so you know. I'm going to promote the hell out of it. I'm going to tag everybody, and I've got 3,600 followers. So it's not like a million people are going to see it, but I'm also going to be on the streets. I'm going to talk to people. I'm going to talk about you in my coffee shop. I'm going to talk about you, da, 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 and you never know who you're going to meet. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I believe that when I'm out training and I'm out meeting people, you're always going to run into somebody that you need to know. Yep. And I, inevitably, it always happens. You run into one, just meet one person. Yep. I'm actually really bad at social events because I, you know, fun fact about me, I was in a boy band. So a boy band. A whole nother conversation. But I was, in a, I, was in a, I was in a boy band that was actually really, really good. So I'm good with performing. I'm good with presenting. But I'm not necessarily good in a house party with nine people. Hmm. Because then I, like, I don't know what to do with my hands. And I don't know how to awkwardly get out of a conversation. And if I start telling a story, because I'm, I'm a really good storyteller, 
all of a sudden I st everybody comes in yeah. and if I tell too many stories then I start thinking okay I'm monopolizing the conversation let somebody else talk because I don't want to be that guy either so I'm always in those situations I'm weird I feel awkward but that also means I need to go to more social events so I deliberately go to social events where I don't know anybody so that I can meet one person so I can try to get over being awkward because I don't know how to, I'm, I'm really weird with like not presenting, Yeah, you know, and I don't necessarily, like I get the leg walks in, the leg books a lot of gigs and I just, <laughs> the leg books a lot of gigs and I'm the handler. I get that. But I also know that I, I need to learn how to also just people like me too. I'm a very likable person, mm -hmm. so I, I can be okay with that. But there are times when I'm just like, Fuck, Bill. Like, you know, I, I have a lot of self-talk that I have to get around too. I think being coachable is a huge thing. I mean, because you can be all of those things, but if you're not coachable, then you're really only limited to like what you can produce right. for yourself. And I, I've learned early, like, just you know, I told you before we started, I like to hang around with people that have accomplished more and really smart people because I feel like if I'm in the room, if they let me in the room, then I must be doing something right. And then eventually, after we get in the room, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm. Rising to their level versus being, you know, the smartest, most accomplished. I don't ever want to be that. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I work really hard to hang around with people that are the kind of people that I want to be thought of. Um, I recently, in the last year or so, I've traveled internationally. I've traveled more in the last three years than I've traveled in the last 20. I've been to Ethiopia twice, Kenya, Sri Lanka, Italy, Portugal, all these different places. And I remember in my 20s, not taking a lot of pictures, never going on vacations, always challenged. I didn't know what I wanted to do career wise. And I kept picking things I wasn't, I couldn't, I wasn't producing at and thinking like, I would love to be one of those people that traveled all the time. I would love to be one of those people that went and did stuff. Right. And then at the end of this year, I remember thinking, holy shit, I'm, I'm like one, one of those, those guys people. that traveled internationally. But you know, I go to, when I've been, I was in Kenya or I'm sorry, Ethiopia back in November, second time there to help make prosthetics with kids with, for limb kind, which you should check out if you don't know about. And I come back from Ethiopia and all of a sudden when I go to an event and somebody's like, so how are you? I'm like, I'm good. You know, what do you do? I do this out in the third. Talk about the leg. Leg is great. You know, how was your summer? I don't know. So when I was in Ethiopia the other day. You were in Ethiopia. Tell us about that. So, I mean, all of a sudden now in real estate, like you've got these Super cool. Spark. Yeah. Like I've got all these cool conversation pieces that I can throw in. And, you know, if, if there's one thing I, I'm very clear about and equivocally about myself, I have like all these great beautiful chapters that you could write and tell stories about which makes me a really interesting hang and i revel in that because i feel like that kind of evens the playing field for you know i'm a 30 million dollar producer in real estate i only deal with you know properties over 10 million on the you know, i don't do any of that but i bet i got some i got the cool story at the table i can tell you some shit <laughs> you know i will make you laugh i will make you cry and i'll end it with can a brother get a cheeseburger and a coke and you will remember my name this is this guy. <laughs> this guy is also being very modest about himself. He doubled his business last year mm. from the previous year. He's not going to say that. I will, um, and he's looking to do the same this upcoming year. So where, um, you know, where do people find you, Billy? Where do, where are you on the street? Where do you hang out? Where can they? Find where you? on the street? On, on the corner of Fort no. uh, Instagram. I'm at Real Estate Triathlete. Um, you can go to the Billy Davis Foundation .com and learn more about my story and the organizations I work with. Um, I work for Compass, so you know I'm all over that. Um, Billy Davis Real Estate. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of where I am. I, I'm I have gun will travel. You know I, I'm in the city. I work in the five boroughs, mostly in Manhattan. I do a lot of stuff in Brooklyn these days, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm you know I'm just out here living one day at a time, trying to make the best of it. You know, and I think every day above ground is a good day, mm -hmm. and I love I love who I get to be inside of real estate. I love who I get to be inside of triathlons. I love who I get to be inside of helping other people, especially people with challenges. Um, the, like I said, I don't do this alone. The organizations that have supported me, organizations like Limkind, Achilles, Aspire, Demcel, they have bent over backwards. I got to give a try that in, out of Oklahoma who sponsored my bikes last year. Literally was like, dude, your bike stinks. You need a new bike here. <laughs> and he sent me two bikes to ride with. Wow. And so Ryan Smoke, I love you. Thank you. Um, and you know, now I'm spoiled because now I just, I look at my bike like a Zamboni. I'm like, man, I love you, but dude, we got to up our bike game. Once you so. get that Primo. Yeah, yeah, once you get a yeah. really nice road yeah. bike, you're like, yeah. it's old 10 speed shit and yeah. cutting it. So, you know, but, you know, there are things that have to happen. And, and, you know, again, even with the company I work with, Compass is amazing. And it's 
granted, they've got this massive market share and Robert Refkin, our, our CEO, is an amazing human being, yeah, yeah. but the culture that he's curated is just so rich and so supportive. Whenever I go to a thing and I introduce myself, people are all, they always want to help. They always want to share, collaborate, think big, work with others. Like, what do you do? I'm doing this thing that's really successful. Let me teach you how to do it so that you yeah. can be successful. Yeah. And I think there are a lot of industries and even companies that don't encourage mm -hmm. that sort of collaboration. So for me, it's, I, I feel like it's a blessing that I am where I am. And even though I haven't produced the numbers I want to, I'm not worried. I mean, the phone always rings right when it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. And as long as you keep putting your face in the water, take a breath, breathe, swim through. Somehow it always works out. And like I said, I don't believe I'm going to drown. So <laughs> you, you said, uh, I get to be, I get to be, I get to be as far as in, you know, working with the foundations you do, being the the great agent that you are, being the triathlete that you are. I get to be, I get to be, I get to be. It sounds like you get to be yourself. I'd like to think so. I mean, I, I am... Like, it's just you being, it's, yeah. you get, you are. It's like, yeah. I'm not mm -hmm. get to be, it's like, it's like I am. Like, it's a privilege. Who I am. I consider know? it a privilege. I mean, I don't think that, you know, it's, it's, I went through the stages of grief in my accident, and there were times when I was like, I, I remember like, God, can I just, just give me a break? Like, I just need a minute. Yeah. You know, the thing about this sort of thing is when it happens, it feels like an albatross. Right. And you just, like, for a I'm just like, just give me a weekend without it, and I'll put it back on, but just give me a weekend. Yeah. And you can't. And so you have to go through the things. And, you know, this, this type of obstacle really, it never happens at a good time. It never happens. With, nobody ever says, well, okay, so get your taxes in order, get your finances in order, repair your relationships, because in May, we're going we're gonna to mess it up. Right. And you, you want to be ready. It just happens. And whatever your credit score is and your income and your relationship with your parents or your girl or your guy is, that's what it is when it happens. And then you get to do that with the weight vest on. And I have been so blessed that I think before my accident, like I said, I was uniquely qualified for this. I'm allergic to alcohol. I'm not a pill guy. I've never been out of shape by any great stretch. And those are the things that you fall victim to first or most like most common. Um, I've got an amazing support system. I'm a great communicator. I'm very coachable. And I just, I like being around people who do stuff. So I hang around people that do stuff. And somehow that always comes back. And, you know, and I, I do everything I can to help anybody I can because I know that the universe will figure out a way to bring it back to me. And I'm okay with that. And it doesn't mean I, I haven't had moments because anybody that's known me long knows, like, like I said, my, I, I fall down a lot. I just always figure out, like, okay, we got one more. Like, I mean, for somebody that's definitely embodied what it means to be yes. sick, scared, and stupid, and who's been able to show the antithesis to that, to be able to show the kryptonite of how to get out of being sick, scared, and stupid, man, it's been awesome to have you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, my man. Um, wow. Like, I know we all got a lot out of it, um, cracking up, but, yeah, thank you all for joining in to another episode of sick scared and stupid and hopefully you got as much out of it as we did um because again billy davis embodies what it means to have been all of those things continuing to be all of those things but also hopefully providing solutions as to not i'm jake thomas thank you all for tuning in be well thank you <laughs>